of exciting. We could take them. I mean, if this was a tug of war, we're on. I'll tug you war. We don't know how many people are out there in, in live land. So whatever you want, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so even my husband is not here. So that shows the support level. <laughs> and it's my wife. So you're there. You go. There we are. Mine's at the dealer's room, probably. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. My wife okay. is still in. My wife was still in bed when I left. So. We're going to talk about co-hosting, not how to have marriages. No. So, um, I'm supposed to begin on time. I'm two minutes late. So, so far, I have failed at my list, which is awesome. Uh, I do want to tell you that we do have an official charity for Dragon Con. It is Open Hand. They are awesome. They help feed the hungry and the elderly. And Dragon Con, as they do every single year for our charity, are matching up to $100,000. So we have to raise at least $100,000 to make sure we get all of that match. There's a bucket up here for you to donate, but there's also a virtual place for you to donate. Mm. Um, it is a very long URL, but I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to post it up on our um, social media channels. So if you find us on Facebook and Instagram, those are the two that will have it. It's donate.openhandatlanta.org. So that part's easy forward slash GE forward slash Dragon Con. And I'll make sure that gets up on our social right after this. So please donate one way or the other so we can make sure to get that $100,000. Don't forget to rate in the Dragon Con app after this that you love us. Don't forget that part. And besides keeping us on time, I'm good now. So I'm Tara Burton, and we're here to talk about co-hosting or not hosting or kicking your host, whichever you may want to do. And I thought the first thing we do is have each of the panelists kind of introduce themselves what they do out there in the podcast digital media world and what their co-hosting situation is. So Sue, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Sue. I'm one of the hosts of Women at Work, we're a Star Trek podcast where we discuss the series from a feminist perspective. Uh, our tagline is intersectional diversity in infinite combinations. And uh, I have six co-hosts. There are seven of us on what we call our crew. Uh, but what we do is we limit each episode to a maximum of four voices. So never more than four people on any episode, including any guests that we may have. So we might have one of our hosts and three guests we, and any combination up to all four hosts. Um, and I can talk more about that when we talk about scheduling and things because it's, it's a lot. With, with seven people, quite a bit goes on. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Faulkner. I'm a writer and a podcaster from here in Atlanta. Uh, right now, I run my website, Creative Criticality, where I discuss all things pop culture, and I tend to guest on a lot of podcasts these days uh, while I do some home renovations and, and get a, a formal podcasting studio kind of built. In uh, in previous attempts, I have done uh, eight years as a solo host on the Weekly Audioplex as part of the Chronic Group Network, and then I was also part of the team uh, as mostly a producer on the Scapecast, which won two parts of the awards at this, at this year convention. And, um, you know, that was a, a rotating team of co-hosts, depending on the situation and the need. I'm Molly DeRozier, and I'm proud of My name is Mike Faber. I am the owner of the ESO Network. I also host three different podcasts. I host First Station One along with my co-host Mike Gordon, and we have tons of guests. And we've been around for over 12 and a half years now, and we've gone through a series of co-hosts on the show and everything, so it'll be interesting to tell you some of those stories. And we also have First Station Who, and I have two co-hosts on that, and then I also um, I'm a co-host on the Dragon Con Report, and we also have the staff before on that one. And we basically, you know, have guests retaining to Dragon Con and such each month. And, you know, it just it varies and such. And then on, her, on the ESO Network, we also have 26 other shows. And, you know, they vary it. And I also sometimes teach people how to podcast and mentor. So it's pretty cool. And I do that along with Mr. Faulkner over there. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Wow. Um, my name is Leanne Lord. Good morning. 
I am a stand-up comedian, author, podcaster. Um, I started podcasting years ago before people were like, hey, what's that? And I just, and one of those people that said, oh, what's this? And I, and I taught myself how. Um, I started with The Urban Irma. Uh, then I moved into doing my own, another podcast called People with Parents, which was about the uh, role reversal between adult children and aging parents. And those, both of those podcasts really fall into like the storytelling uh, type of podcast. They're very short. You can binge all the episodes in like, you know, two hours because they're like five or ten minutes. They're very short, very nice. funny and entertaining um, and poignant. Um, but most people, um, if they know of me in the podcast world, well, it all is because I used to be one of the co-hosts of uh, Star Talk Radio uh, with uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, where I, I spent most of my time smiling and nodding at science things. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of the barometer. If, I, if my face looked confused, then he knew he would have to explain it differently for regular people. Uh, so that was my, my stint as a, as a co-host working with someone. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here and share anything I can possibly share that would be helpful to you. So I'm Cara Burton, and I started podcasting a little show called Bumbling Azeroth with my best buddy uh, because everyone did not want to hear us talk about World of Warcraft for some reason. So we decided to talk to microphones about it. Uh, seemed like a good thing at the time. And now mostly I co host with myself. So I solo coast a lot, and I have guest speakers on my Vigiki side, which I'm looking for people to come talk to me. So if you want to come talk to me, I'd love to have you on the Vigiki side. But I guess the first thing I want to find out is how did you guys choose uh, or get wrangled in to hosting with somebody? So, Mike, you've been doing your show for 12 and a half years. How did that start? Well, when I first started our Station 1, I had been a co-host before that on a couple other podcasts. And I realized, I started researching how to do the technology, how to do this, because I've been podcasting since 2007, 2008. And when I started Earth Station, had the idea for Earth Station One, I thought, how should I do this? How, what would be the best way? I don't want to sit there by myself. So I talked to my nephew into it, who was in college at the time, and as a co-host. And he had no podcast experience and such. But he also was studying and such, so he didn't really have time to commit to it full time. So after like four or five episodes, I was seeing that he was not able to show up sometimes. So sometimes I would have my wife sit in, sometimes I'd have even my, at the time, eight-year-old son, you know, join us for it and talk about, you know, watching Doctor Who for the first time or showing him Yellow Submarine and stuff like that for the first time to get an eight-year-old's reaction to it. But then, literally, I found this guy named Corey as a co-host, and he and I got along really well, but he only lasted five episodes because something came up in his life, and 20 minutes before we were supposed to do an episode, he, he, call, he called me on the phone. It was weird. I'd never gotten a call from him. Hey, dude, I'm not going to do the podcast anymore. Thanks for letting me join you. Bye. Ooh. And it was panic time because I had no one else on the show for me and I literally was going to be talking about Lost the season, last season of it and it was just like what am I going to do? Thank goodness I had a friend Darren who I knew who was on another podcast and I knew he loved Lost. I said hey what are you doing tonight? Nothing and it's like you're going to be on it tonight and we went. he was sitting in with me temporarily as it goes and then I got this letter from this guy who listened to our show, and he said, "Howdy, I love your show, and I listen every week, and I really like your, what you're doing." And this was episode 16 that he wrote this, and I read it on the air, and I, and I said, "Hey, if you want to come on the show, we'd love to have you as a guest." And you know, literally ever since then, Mike Gordon's been my co-host. Exactly, and it's pretty. It was pretty awesome, and so he's been with me literally twelve years this month. That's a long partnership. It is. Yeah, I, it is, and the marriages don't last that long. I tease him, and I say my first marriage lasted shorter than I was with him. You know. Yeah, exactly. I don't have to see him every day. I kill him. So. so I'm interested in how you got 
how the curly hair coffee I got together. Yeah, so that actually proved out great for me. Uh, well, it's a sweet I do a great job for That's awesome. It was a happy accident, basically. There can be love at first sight. So, Leanne, yeah. how did you get on Star Talk Radio? It is such a bizarre thing that happened in my life. Um, I got a random email from somebody on Neil's team, and I thought it was a joke. I really? Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone, hey, have you ever heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson? And this is before he was famous, famous. Yeah. But he was, I'm a nerd, so I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? And uh, he said, well, he, he's starting this new podcast. Well, he has a podcast. He's looking for a co-host. Would you like to meet him and talk about it? I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. And, and I, so I had a show that week. I was actually recording uh, my second stand-up album. And I said, I'm going to be at Gotham Comedy Club. Would you like to meet there? And he's like, oh, yeah, Neil's, Neil loves comedy. He came to the show. We sat down and had a conversation. And he is very... Um, charismatic, very, um, when he's in the room, he's in the room and we hit it off. It was just, and that's, I think what he wanted to see, could we hit it off? Will we have chemistry? And we did. And that night he said, Hey, would you like to? I said, yes. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even let him wow. really finish the question. I wasn't even sure what I was signing up for. Um, and my job really was to be in the, with the comics that he has brought in. Um, you know, before and after have been, we're sort of serve as the everyman, you know, so he's, he's, he's really good at communicating science, but every now and then he kind of gets into really sciencey things, if I can say that technically. And he's a jerk. yes, and uh, in my face, uh, you can't see through the mask, it can be very expressive. I, I have a hard time hiding how I'm feeling. So if I looked confused, he would go, oh, okay. <laughs> and then start over. And then when the light bulb dawned and I would smile, he would know if I understand it, then regular people understand it. Um, and I was there, I, I don't know, uh, maybe two years. Uh, Lynn Coplitz was there before me, then me, then um, uh, oh, with a gentleman, I'm blanking on his name, he's still there. But Matt they Myra? like, hmm? is it Matt Myra? Mm -mm, no, I'm thinking of someone else. Okay. It doesn't um, matter after you. It's yeah, no, after right. me, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I just down, I just know it was, it, it was my first time um, being a, um, a, a, a co host, and really, and it, it, I had no control over that. They asked, I said yes, and it was fun to do. There we go. The end. <laughs> Again, we're finding lots of falling into things. So yes. Yes. Sue and Michael, you're you're coming up. So Sue, how how do you get seven? <laughs> well, we I started with four. Okay. Um, and it was a, a confluence of events. Um, back in around the same time, 2012, 2013, 2014. Uh, the four of us who were the uh, original four hosts were all sort of in the Star Trek fan space. I was doing another podcast and writing. Um, Jarrah was writing. Andy was uh, doing 
she's she's first time Trek on Twitter. So she was doing her, her tweets and getting a big, big following from tweeting her first time through Star Trek. Um, and Grace was doing another Star Trek podcast. And we sort of all rotated through Grace's specific Trek podcast as guests mm. until the point where it was Andy, doesn't matter who, but said, we should do this together. Because at the time, as far as we know, there was no Star Trek podcast hosted entirely by women. Mm. And if you know anything about Star Trek fan history, that's a problem because women have, have led the Star Trek fandom since 1966. So we got together and decided to start the show. And um, back in 2020, we decided to expand the show. You know, we, we looked around and we're like, look, we know it's, it's an issue. We know we're all white ladies. Let's expand this. And we reached out to people who had been guests on the show before, who we'd worked with a lot, who we liked a lot, and uh, invited three more people to join the crew. And it was it's from being in the, the fan spaces that we all knew each other. So and we the four of us, the, the original four, we didn't even meet in person until two years into our show. Wow. That's so awesome. if, if you I'm, I say this as I'm wearing my enterprise ring, if you need number eight. <laughs> I'm gonna, I could we'll talk, talk about we'll Star talk. Trek ad nauseum. That's the coolest mm -hmm. enterprise ring ever. <laughs> Is, is that, that the, the one with the blue stone in the song yes, section? Yes, Yep, I know that one. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though, because there's lots of times when you have co-hosts, and a lot of times you record it remotely. You don't actually even meet your co-hosts in person mm -hmm. until I didn't meet Mike Gordon in person until what, eight months later, after we first started hosting together. Yeah. The first time we were all in the same room, it was the hotel room we were sharing at wow. the 50th anniversary convention for Star Trek. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you found out if you really liked each other. Yeah, we found out real fast. <laughs> so, Michael, where have you landed in the co-hosting, guesting arena, and how? Uh, well, the, the escape cast, we want to go all the way back to the escape cast. That was me just just reaching out, kind of like Michael Gordon did with, with uh, Mr. Faber here. You know, I, they had a, a question on the show, what is Farscape? That was their audience oh. engagement question. And a lot of people would just go onto the forum when forums were a thing, or call into a voicemail number when voicemail was also a thing, and uh, just leave a quick, you know, this is what it means to me, and that was it. I was the, the dumb guy who wrote up an essay <laughs> because I had a, a unique experience. I was in the Navy. I was watching this in between deployments and stuff. My wife was also watching it. We were kind of doing a simultaneous keep up kind of thing. And I shared that story with the people at Scapecast and their audience. And right after I sent it to him, I got an email back from the, the editor. Uh, and she says, number one, can we use it on the show? I'm like, sure, that's why I sent it to you. Number two, do you want to write for us? OK, let's do this. And so I started writing for them and eventually led into a producer role with them where I was kind of herding the cats of the writer's room to get the material from the writers to the editors so we could get everything squared away. And in that time, you know, on, on my piece of the forum, you can also go look at the other pieces of the of the back, behind the scenes forum and see like, you know, we had two normal co-hosts, you know, Kevin Batchelder and, and Lindy Ray. But if one of those those folks couldn't be there, they picked somebody else from the main crew who had been there the longest to jump in. And since they're, you know, every one of us was really tight knit, it was really easy just to jump in, you know, discuss the banner really quick, and then just start putting things together because everyone knew each other. Uh, so then going from the scape cast when that, you know, when that finally ended, um, I was like, well, I've got the rig. I should use the rig for something. Um, I, w I had an idea to do a movie news type podcast, but nowhere really to put it. And I noticed that one of the networks I, I had been listening to, the Chronic Rift Network, was going through some, some changes where the Chronic Rift was a public access show in New York City in the 1990s. And they... They were together doing their thing when they were coming up, and then they took a break and then came back in the 2000s as an actual podcast, and they decided to, to kind of call it as an end. But it was obvious that the guy who built the thing was not ready to let it go. He was just like, this is still my baby. I want to do something with it. And so I reached out and was like, I've got the rig. I've got an idea. Do you want to restart this thing? Let's go. And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So I started doing the weekly patio plex, which was just basically... Here's the box office report for what happened last week. Here's what's coming on in the theaters and on, on DVD. A little bit of news, and I'm out. 20 minutes. And just, just ran with it. Eventually, I brought in a kind of a news hound, you know, is what I lovingly referred to her as. 
and uh, she'd go out and grab the news for me because I just got too busy. But you know, after a while, it's like, this is taking forever to put together. I kind of lost that passion of, of building it. Eight years is a long time to do something like that. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm good. And, and since then, I just used the rig to, to guest on shows that'll listen to me talk about anything. So. We like listening to you. We like no. having you on. For the record, times. the yeah. Scapecast is the reason I started coming to Dragon Con 12 years oh, ago. That's awesome. This guy. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I think one thing when you have co host or you're having guest host, and particularly I, I can speak to that because uh, now that I'm solo casting, is herding cats yes. and how you get everything to work together. So, Leanne, if you want to start, we'll just go down the road talking about how do you help manage your schedule with your co host or with your guest host? And, well, I mean, that's, I guess, one of the, I'm not on um, Star Talk now, and they managed all of yeah, that. Yeah, you were lucky. They just said show up. Right? Yeah, they really did. They just said show up, and I did, um, which that's almost a, a very disingenuous way to start because you think it's always that easy, and it is not. Um, but I'm uh, a workaholic, control freak, perfectionist. I'm working on it. She's a Virgo. Oh, yes, yes. So type A, type A minus. Um, <laughs> and I like so that. I, I like, like doing my own podcast on my own schedule on my own time. So, so it's really wrangling me. Which can be difficult. Yes. Because we put ourselves at the bottom of the to-do list. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not even sure it's really been how to answer the question because it's just me. So how do you make sure that you actually thought because that's my biggest problem is that i put me at the bottom of the pot list so how do you make sure that you actually get it done um well the podcast that's kind of just wrapped now um people with parents um i started that podcast because my parents were getting older and our roles were actually reversing and no one ever had that talk with me on how to do that and i was lost and as an artist how do you process your pain. You either put it on stage, you write a song about it if you're a musician, or you do a podcast as a comedian. And I that's, I was literally just telling stories about what was happening between me and my parents. And so in terms of being a good podcaster, I was not because there would be these long stretches of me dealing with them and life. And then, you know, putting a story out there when I had a chance. And I thought, oh, people aren't listening to this because I'm not, I'm breaking the rules. I'm not doing it once a week, every week, consistently. And yet, whenever I would drop an episode, people were there. People were listening. And I even thought about saying, hey, you guys, it's getting heavy. I might stop. And people reached out to me. They were like, no, please don't stop. You don't understand. There are other people who are in this situation. We like listening to you talk about this and, and talk it out. And they share it. And just as I was really, really going to end the podcast, the Wall Street Journal reached out to me. <laughs> wow. Yes. And uh, they said, hey, you have this podcast. Can you give us the artwork and the links? I was like, yeah, sure. Here you go. And I ended up on a list of uh, top 10 podcasts for uh, older adults. Um, yeah. The four podcasts that are enlightening and entertaining. And mine was the only one that talks about that transition, that natural family transition that nobody talks about, but so many people are going through. Yeah, exactly. And how do you how do you do that with some grace and some humor and some humility, you know, and then trying to maintain their dignity. Like I never saved my parents' names. It was either mom or dad, or I would refer to them as Ozzy and Ruby, as, an, as Ozzy and Ruby Davis. Yeah, Ozzy, Ruby, yeah. Ozzy Davis and Ruby D. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'm an example of a bad podcaster. No, I think that's great because you gave yourself permission to do it when you could. You know? Yeah. And for the people who listened, they got it, you know, because when life happens at that speed in that very real way, I guess it would be like a mom doing a podcast, having, you know, kids, you're, you're just, you're not going to have that, you know, rigorous schedule. And people were very um, patient and kind and supportive. Um, and it, the man next to you has a rigorous schedule. So he can talk about that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, Crazy me, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, it's more of scheduling out and literally, you know, I have a game plan. I'm already scheduled for podcasts for Earth Station One all the way into March 2023. Oh, I love that. And literally, you know, we have topics coming out. The, we don't actually, there's so many topics we could ta be talking about we have to double up on some episodes wow. and such, or we do bonus episodes for our patrons and talking about different shows. And 
it's just amazing to be able to do stuff like that. And each episode, we have to get guests. So we have, because Earth Station One is a magazine style show. So we have an interview segment with a celebrity, a podcaster, an artist, a musician. And then we have the main topic and we have to have experts on that topic mm -hmm. sitting in with us or joining us to talk about it or even just fans. And so each week I have to go in and schedule that. And it's like hurting, like you said, like hurting cats. And it's craziness to be able to do that. But then I have also Earth Station Who, which is the Doctor Who podcast that I do. And we have experts on each episode there to talk about. And I schedule out a lot further out so we make sure we're not caught with our pants down, which we have in the past. But we've had celebrities you know, or or interviewees cancel at the last minute. Hey, I'm being called on to stage, mm -hmm. or I'm not into doing podcasts anymore. You know, so you have to worry about that. But a lot of times in the past, if we have a really good chemistry with somebody sitting in with us, or and they we make them more of a regular. That's how we got Mike Faulkner and Sue actually comes on the show quite a bit too. And we have them as regulars when we know that it's a topic they appreciate and that they want to talk about and we get folks regularly to do that and it's awesome when you start building a stable up of it's almost like mission impossible you throw the cards down and you know and then the, the tape self destructs after 30 seconds so it's perfect but it's it's a game you have to play with it and you know then also owning the network i also have to make sure all the shows are keeping up with everything also and going back to co-hosts that's how we've gotten various co-hosts on earth station who and earth station one over the years because we've had people come and go or they've spun off into their own show after being co-hosts on us and everything because hey i want to try it they won't go a lot of times i want to try it on my own and a lot sometimes it's very successful or sometimes they fail and they come back with their tails between their legs. You know, it just all depends. And, you know, like a good papa, I'm there waiting for them. Oh, come on back home. It's okay. So it's pretty cool. Mm. How do you find, because you have to find very specific people for your science podcast. So how do you go about booking them and making sure they'll show up and have the right equipment if they don't do this on a regular basis? So for William Walk, you the the key to the longevity has been to really manage our expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we started the, the very first episode, in fact, one of my fellows just came in, who was the CME head fellow, Matt J.L. Explorer. Uh, we, uh, you know, we did this for fun for us, and then we kept doing it. So when we record, we do not edit. Really? What? Nothing. what? Nothing. Nice. Nothing. We don't wow. I put a title card at the front, and that's it. I That's love awesome. It. That's cool. Um, makes it makes organic. You know, so My type is. You know, some, some episodes we do a really good job and we we'll keep it to our 15 minute segments and we come in right at an hour where we want to be. And other episodes we lose track of time and we go, we talk for two hours. And, you know, but it's one of those things that just, you know, it happens. So we're committed to that. You know, we're not um, biting off more than we can chew. We're three very busy professional people. We don't have a lot of technological expertise, you know, uh, we made it easy. And so we use the tools that are available to us for free. We record it, we upload it, we put it out there, and that's it. That's awesome. Um, so the, the guests that we have on as far as scheduling them, it just becomes um, like opportunistic. It's, you know, when, when there's a particular movie that's coming out or if somebody comes to us and says, hey, there's this movie I really love and I would love to talk about it, great, let's have you on, let's start a, a chat thread and see when everybody's available and, and we'll you know get online on a Tuesday night at seven o'clock and just bang it out. But because we know that there's not that big production in of it, um, as soon as we stop recording it's ready to go. So that makes it very, very convenient. And I think I think that's an important thing to remember. You do not have to have high production value like to, to put out a good product. Mm -mm. to put out something that people are going to want to listen to and that you are going to want to keep doing but for a long time. And you can just say what you have to say and put it out there. And, and if people like it, they're going to like it, and it's a matter of if it looks slick or not. Wow. 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I think that whole idea of managing expectations with yourself, but it also manages them with your audience as well. Yeah. And that's what we also tell people, like when we do, Mike and I do our class, anybody can podcast. Mm -hmm. Anyone could do it. But you don't have to have all this huge equipment and everything to do it. There's tons of free equipment out there, and that's pretty awesome. I'm, I, I put me as my laptop computer, and the gaming headset, I still feel like Sony. <laughs> yes. I'm a firm believer, and this is an unpopular opinion in a lot of podcast communities. I'm a firm believer that content is much more important than audio quality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I have a, a clear enough recording that I can understand a guest, I'll use that recording. If yeah. there's meowing in the background, better for it oh, if, if they're static they i'll try and take it out but you know what i'll do what i can no. um in terms of of scheduling with with seven people <laughs> when potentially eight, <laughs> potentially eight. <laughs> uh, when it was just four of us it really happened kind of organically it was like let's do this next okay i'll do the research for that right mm -hmm. um and that that becomes unsustainable when you're managing so many people and it was um when we first expanded it was a struggle and there was a lot of last minute stuff that came up uh, and, you know, oh, this didn't happen. We got to fill in an episode. And we recently adopted a system that uh, it's quarterly. We release every other week. Um, so it, it comes out to, you know, six to seven episodes per quarter. So one each host is in charge of one episode per quarter. They choose the topic. They lead the research. They lead the recording. If they want a guest, they're in charge of finding any guests. And on, on that schedule is also a sign-up sheet. So it says the lead for the episode, and then there are open spots. And if they have a guest, they put in their guest name. If one of the other hosts is like, that's an episode I want to talk about, that's a topic I want to talk about, we write in our names. So it's a schedule slash sign-up. Cool. And we've been using that for most of this year, and it's working out, for the most part, really well. That's not to say that we haven't had you know cancellations or things coming up that we've had to adjust for but um when you you basically you have to find the system that works for for your show and your hosts uh in terms of your your additional question about guesting we also have a document that we wrote up a long time ago that is we call recording instructions for guests mm -hmm. yes. so yes. when somebody agrees to be on the show we send them that and it's not it's not very techy it's like all you need is a microphone and something, a program to record yourself, and headphones. Even more important than your microphone are your headphones, mm -hmm. because the echo is the thing we can't take out. Feedback or echo is the one of yeah. the worst things you could have with and, guests. Mm -hmm. And it's it's simple. Like, it's not even, like, we, we the, the Mac recording instructions, because we have it written out for Mac and PC. Yeah. The one on Mac is just using voice memo. We don't even tell them to open a garage band, and the quality is fine. Mm -hmm. So we make it as simple as we can that we can send to anybody. Mr. Faulkner, running the table. Running the weekly Audioplex over eight years was, it, it ran the spectrum of motivations. Cause like you start out like every podcaster does mm -hmm. and it's like, this is awesome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot for the moon. I'm gonna do all I can, go, go, go. And you realize what workload's gonna be and you start streaming the workload out for 15 to 20 minutes of actual content at the 30 minutes. I was recording for an hour and a half, also doing the editing, mm -hmm. then also doing the research for what I was going to script out for like four hours. And that that's wait, also waiting for box office results or whatever else to come in so I can actually move that, that data into where I need it to be. On top of that, it's like, okay, assemble that. I'm going to send it off to John, who's the guy who runs the Chronic Rift Network, who wanted to do a last bin of producing pass on it and assemble it himself. So it, it sounded the way he wanted it to and then put it on the feed for everyone to listen to. It was a production for 30 minutes. And you know, it, it, as that starts to kind of wear on, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing these things. You're like, okay, is this even worth it? And then you get the, the feedback. And there was, there was hardly any feedback from Weekly Podioplex. I got one note early on from a friend of mine who's like, hey, that thing you're doing every Tuesday, keep doing that. <laughs> Strangely enough, that was yeah. motivation to like, mm -hmm. okay, good. Someone is listening and someone likes what I'm doing. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And then eventually it was like, okay, this is starting to wear on me. And I threw out there on Facebook. And I kind of wish I had somebody do the news segment for me because it's really hard to, to with, my, with my day job as a nuclear engineer, 
balance that out. Like I'm, I'm trying to focus on this and also surf the internet looking for stuff, you know? And that's when Denise said, me. That's like, oh, well, A, she's listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and B, yes, I've got someone. And ran for a couple more years before the, the motivation finally hit, like, this isn't worth it anymore. It's, it's time to hang it up. But it was, it was just up and down, up and down, up and down because of, of the, the intense workload and forcing myself, as we've been talking about, like, I have an obligation. I'm treating this like a job, a mm -hmm. second job. I have no choice but to put this out there because I promised somebody I would. I promised John and I promised myself mm -hmm. that this has to go. So, you know, it's, it's put on the game face. Okay, <sighs> everything's on. Let's go. And it's it's a whole new personality almost. It's, it's there it weeks you, be. You, yeah. you just don't care. And then you have to care. One of the things, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm just going to say very, very quickly that it's, it's early, and but I'm going to call it and say the best sentence I've heard today is my day job as a nuclear engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I have to put that out there. It's, it's a literal showstopper at parties. Like, what do you do? And I say, engineer. No, no. What kind of engineer? I'm a nuclear engineer. Oh. Okay. And they wander <laughs> off. We're like, so how about that meltdown? They, well, we don't talk about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Nuclear One of the things I'm most proud of, uh, especially, and it's, it's a silly thing sometimes when I say it, I, I, at least I feel that way, is that we've never missed a release date. Nice. Which uh. is, is kind of incredible. And episode 200 drops at the end of September. Um, so in, in 200 episodes, plus some extras thrown in there, we've never missed a release date, which is, is kind of incredible, um, especially when, when managing a bunch of people, when a lot of us are neurodiverse. Um, so, uh, but it's, it doesn't mean it's easy. You know, there are times that we've not missed that release date by about 15 minutes, meaning like I stayed up all night finishing up an edit, but it's, it's, it's a weird thing, but I'm very, very proud of it. I, I imagine the motivations, you know, for working around the neurodiversity are, are, are I mean, the difficulties stuff are, are probably more intense, right? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I, uh, I have ADHD, and that means I'm very deadline motivated. ADHDers mm -hmm. have now and not now. Yeah, and when yeah. something is not now, it doesn't become now until it's almost due. So that, you know, I can, I can do that edit later. I can do that edit later. Oh crap. The episode releases in three hours. I need to do that edit, you know, so that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's and, interesting too, because I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. I need to have it yeah. out every day at a weekly, at a certain time. And we release it early for our patrons, you know, 48 hours earlier. Yeah. And so I usually record on Mondays and I usually have, a 24-hour turnaround to get it up on Patreon and then out to the world on two days later. It's tough because, like you, I haven't missed a deadline. Um, in the 12 and a half years, we have not missed an episode. But, and we're a weekly podcast. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, like, we're up to episode 645. And I think it's just gone through. And I'm not planning on stopping it. And like Mike... I have a day job, like most of us do. And, you know, I have... Yes, I'm know, a nuclear scientist. I'm not... I am, <laughs> sorry, I'm not... I am not a nuclear scientist. But you know how to interview nuclear scientists. Yes, I do. It, yes. It, it, there's a tr trick but to it. But it was something... You talked out of podcasting, though. Has oh, yes. Up to the mic and I Let's find out. I have a feeling that he has a question. Of course he does. I do have a question. Uh, I came from a background of not trusting myself. So I always felt like I have had had to have co-hosts to do better, and then ultimately found a way to kind of do my own show. So the question is, how do you decide for yourself when you need a host to make the show better, or when just your voice would be the right solo show to do? For me, I just want to say, first off, for those of you that could not see him pick up the microphone, uh, the Rock Out of Podcasting is so tall he has to hold the mic up to just. <laughs> So Mike, go ahead and then. No, just for me, it was confidence at first. You know, I wanted to have a co-host with me because at the time when I did it, I had been a co-host and I was like, who wants just to listen to me ramble about my geek obsessions for an hour? 
every week and such. And so that's why I brought co-hosts in. And now it's natural. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and I've done shows on my own. I've done specials. I've done, you know, other projects that I'm working on and everything where I've just done stuff on my own. And I get listeners, people listen to me or people, you know, say, hey, when are you doing another one of these? It's mm -hmm. just, for me, it was confidence in a lot of ways to get to that point. I think it depends on what type of show you want to have. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you want a show that is about your experience, then all you need is you. If you want a show that's that's discussion based, then you need other people there, right? I um, unless you have split personality. Well, for yeah. for us, you know, our our show is based mostly on analysis of a television show, and that's interpretation, and a lot of that is personal. And I wouldn't want that to just be me. I want people with different interpretations talking to each other. I've had my mind changed about Star Trek episodes that I have had opinions about since 1991, mm -hmm. you know? So um, <laughs> I, I have recently changed my mind to believe that the inner light is actually incredibly problematic. And you don't... It, what? It, it took... Yeah, we can talk about it later. Yeah. It took... <laughs> someone else who had just seen the episode for the first time giving me her opinion for me to see it in a different way. And that is what I want our show to do. So it needs multiple people to be able to do that. So it, whether you have multiple people or one person or two people depends on the goal, really, of the show that you want to make. Yeah, for, for putting her mafia as a whole point of our show is to look at not only different personal perspectives on the movies, but science perspectives. And we have three very different experiences, professionally, very different work experiences in STEM. And so that dynamic is what really propels the content. And it's interesting, too, like Earth Station Who, where each week we review a different episode of Doctor Who. And it's people have written us and say, you guys agree too much with each other. Mm. Right? You, know, you guys got to get more diverse. <laughs> and it's like, no, because if it's good, we'll say it's good. But we are, we don't hesitate to say if we don't like something, we don't like it. We, and we get that comment often as well. You all, you all agree with each other. And yeah. I don't think we do. I, I think don't either. People That's on the, the internet just think that disagreement means yelling. Mm. When, exactly. dis when yes. disagreement can actually be, I hear you, but I disagree. Yeah. Exactly. People don't expect that. And we're, I, I, we're polite about it. We're yeah. not like, yeah, you ask, blah, 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 yeah, and, you know, yeah. cussing and yelling and screaming. I'm not going to throw a chair at somebody through <laughs> the computer. The, the weekly body Plex is actually a good example of, of understanding where to go next with the, with the hosting situation. Cause I, I thought it was fine just to be me chatting at the computer for 20 minutes, you know, and, and spitting something out. But in the eight years that it ran, I've also evolved a lot as a person and what I want to see and what I want to what I want to put out there. And I when I hung up the hat, it was not a, you know, this is it, goodbye, I'm closing the doors. It is I'm turning off the lights, I'm coming back to this at some point. It's not done. And the the evolution as I'm talking to some friends would be before COVID hit and we couldn't do this anymore, um, getting everybody in the same room at my place and recording a batch of episodes so that it was 20 minute talking, you know, discussion segments. And we discuss something that's happening in the entertainment industry because that's huge. You know, like talking about analysis of movies and television or whatever else, discussing, you know, trailers and stuff. And then that would be become the next evolution of it. But to do that, you need people. But it, it was, it was, it, is, it was an internal discussion of, Eight years of sitting here by myself doing this, I'm tired of talking to myself about this. There are more people that ha that need to be involved in discussion because we need to put this out there further. Mm -hmm. It needs to be something that that we all start thinking more critically about. And it's it, funny. I was the exact opposite. And when I started People with Parents, I had very lofty goals. I was going to bring in elder care attorneys. I was going to bring in other people who were sort of further down the path of caring for their elderly parents, and it quickly became too much uh, for me to do that way. And it really became very personality-based. I mean, as a stand-up comic, I'm on stage by myself. I'm writing my own material. I'm used to working on my own. So it was just a natural progression that people who were listening were listening to me. They were listening to hear about the characters, I guess you could call them, 
um, of my parents. People were invested in that personal story, you know, so much so that um, my, we live in a, lived in a multi-generational house where my father controlled the heat and air conditioning and he was turning on the heat in July. Oh no. Oh no. Because a little bit of dementia and he was always cold as an old guy. And we had this war going on about the thermostat and the temperature of the house. And I, I would talk about this to the point where people would stop and go, hey, yeah, hey, how you doing? How, how the thermostat war is going? And you're like, I had no idea people were this invested in what was going to happen with just the temperature of a multi-generational house. And what I finally decided to do, I actually took out the thermostat, put in a new one that I control on my phone, and it was pandemonium. Like people were, it was like this little cliffhanger soap opera but also real happening in real time. And that's, those are the types of stories that people got interested in hearing my voice tell. So, so I started podcasting with a partner and part of the reason was because of the tech. I didn't mm. want to edit a podcast for my life. I didn't want to do that. He did that, bless his heart. And so that was my fear of going solo. Mm. And so when I finally decided to podcast again I had another partner because I was uh, again a little iffy about doing this on my own and but I was the one doing the tech and trying to get a schedule was difficult mm -hmm. and we'll wrap along about that in a second but I eventually decided that I wanted to do my own and I tell the stories of my life is really what I'm doing mm -hmm. and so being authentic there and it's not about my sometimes it's about my opinion of Obi-Wan Kenobi but it could be other <laughs> but uh, it, to me it was embracing that I could do the tech I do not do it to the level nice people do. I cut out the beginning, I cut out the end, I put on an intro and an outro and say hello, have a nice day. That's, you know, yeah, yeah I can't edit out that all the ends. I but, do that. Yeah, I, I taught myself how to edit. It. It's crazy. Yeah, no, I know the two of you next to me do that. So <laughs> I got over the fear and managed my expectations so that I didn't have to. I like what you're doing. Yeah, no, I like I, that. And I'm, I'm sitting here listening to the point of <laughs> it isn't. It, it isn't. That's the thing. You're the mafia. You do it how you want. You yeah, could, that's you could go the alternate route of training them out of your speech. I'm sorry, what? You could go the alternate route of training them out of your speech. Yes. And then you just randomly pause in the middle of sentences. <laughs> what? Just, just come at me next time. <laughs> I do too. If I had stopped the thing that I had to do all of the tech mm -hmm. part that I had to do that in order to release something that I would never have done. It. Mm -hmm. I've never would have done it. It sounds somewhat daunting a lot of times if you think about it, but I just got used to doing it mm -hmm. and it just, it's like automatic each week. I think it's gotten a lot more accessible than when I started, you know, women oh, at yeah. war has been around for seven, eight years. I was doing a show before that and there was, it, there was a lot more complicated and now there are services that exist the first one that pops to mind is Streamyard. you can have a free Streamyard account yeah. and stream to multiple platforms and it's then it's just out there it's released and that was that was not a thing no. even three years ago no. so the the accessibility towards towards podcasting towards streaming has gotten significantly better and I think some of us who just started earlier are set in our ways. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's yes. the evolution of podcasting yeah. that Mike and I talk about all the time in our one-on-one -on -one courses. Like it used to be, you had to have files you record, you put, you hook them to an RSS feed, you throw them out in the world, and now you listen to someone like T. Morris, who is one of the the grandfathers of podcasting. He's like, YouTube is the fastest growing platform for podcasts. Mm -hmm. That's just because yeah. it now it's just on-demand media. That's mm -hmm. all podcasting is. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I I find now when Back in the day, you know, when someone invited me to be a guest, it was automatic that it was just audio. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to put on makeup. Right. Now I got to ask, is your podcast video? And then it's like, they say yes. I'm like, oh. Oh. And it's not a pod. I, there's, like, there's got to be another term. To me, that's not a podcast. Right. If I yeah. put on a face. Right. If I got to put on a face. Yeah, that's a different and, thing. And we have I a need... nice panel later today about that. We do. Oh, what time yes. is that? It's on the back of the car. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that my nap time? I'm so old. <laughs> uh, four o'clock, so you have a face for radio, surviving yes. the evolution of podcasting to video. <gasps> I noticed we're all during... Be we once... have 10 minutes left, okay. oh. so does anybody else besides the Rock God have questions for us? <laughs> the Rock God can ask another if you want. 
one third yeah. of the curly hair mafia coming to the stage. Yeah. 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 So I know you all do a lot of stuff yourself, but a lot of municipalities are really in universities are really kind of leaning into podcasting with podcasting studios. Like in my city in St. Louis, the main public library has a whole studio. Yes. Yeah. Really? yeah. It's a whole studio. It's, like there, it's really it's you see it at universities. Some of these fancy pants high schools are doing mm -hmm. it. Mm. So I was just curious, um, like, are you seeing more folks coming out of either something formal, like the high school or the college programs or community college, or even these kind of like, I taught myself like through municipal programs. Like, what do you see the role in now this more community investment in studios? Do you You're think seeing a lot of that yeah. now, and it's great because it's teaching a lot of people how to podcast. Mm -hmm. But once they get past the first doing it and you have to have to still have the commitment mm -hmm. to do it. And that's what Mike and I actually talk about a lot in our course. A lot of podcasts do not make it past their 10th episode yep. because mm -hmm. they realize how much work mm -hmm. there is to it. And it gets into the whole co-hosting thing. It, you know, if you're a solo podcaster, it's a lot of work. And, you know, then to come up with content that's reliable and building an audience and building a lot of times basically what continuity and building a core audience because if you're only putting out a podcast once every six months or something mm. you're not going to get a, a people listening to you all the time and everything so i i feel like there was like a podcasting boom uh in early 2020 like when every when a lot of people were were in lockdown yes. and a lot of people were being laid off and you know i i think like probably most people up here i'm in a lot of those podcasting groups on the internet and just over and over again there were posts in these these support groups of i want to start a podcast what should it be about Ugh, right. or i want to start a podcast when will i start making money mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah never. and how never, can i get rich podcast never first you can't yeah. unless you're already famous mm -hmm. um but the the thing is if you you it's so much more than just having the equipment and knowing how to record mm -hmm. right there we talked about this on a podcast roundtable i did last night over on trek track uh, a lot of people think you flip the switch you talk into the microphone for 20 minutes you hit stop and you send it out to the, the world mm -hmm. and there's there's so much more there's the the pre-production and there's the post-production and there's the promotion that comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there's communicating with people. There's like engagement. If you're promoting your show on social media, it, you, if you just throw out their new episode up, but you don't talk to the people who are talking to you, they're not going to stick around. Exactly. There's, there's you so many more audience. things yeah. going on. So, you know, I think it's great that these spaces are available to people who need them. Mm -hmm. But there's more to teach about podcasting than just how to record. And I, I feel like these studios, like they are, they're great to have right? because yeah. it does get more people out there to to put their passions into the world and mm -hmm. be creative. But they're also, in my opinion, kind of like another co-host that you have to schedule around. They're a silent co-host. Mm -hmm. the, the recording studio and the people there aren't going to contribute to your podcast, except for giving you a space. And you gotta be like, okay, Mike and I are available on Saturday at five, but the studio's not they're booked well crap now i gotta work around that mm -hmm. you know it's and it's interesting too because owning a podcast network i have shows coming to me weekly hey i want to join the network i have two episodes out <laughs> you know and you know how do i join that's one of the rules over the years that we've had to build for ourselves you cannot join our network unless you have like seven shows mm -hmm. you know, and put out reliably on a consistent basis to join the network because mm -hmm. there are so many shows that are flash in the pans and yeah. everything. We've made the mistake of having shows join our network. You know, over the years, you know, right now we have 26 shows on our network. We counted up since we started ESO 10 years ago, we've had over 70 podcasts as part of our network. They, most of them who are no longer with us are no longer in existence and everything, which is interesting. So we have five minutes, but I'm a professor at a university that has a lot of podcasting studios. And I will say you hit the nail on the head with the, um, it's the third co-host that you have to schedule. Getting into it is hard, but um, I actually have my students create podcasts. 
so that they understand what goes into one. So they have to do an eight episode series of a podcast or a project that they do. Wow. And Mike and Michael come and talk to my class. Matter of fact, that's coming up soon. September 15th. And Charles in the back comes as well. And they find out that they really love it, but they're like, that's hard to get everybody together and mm-hmm. schedule them. Yeah. But I love the fact that it at least gets them to understand it and they fall in love with podcasts. So even if they don't end up podcasting, they get to see that maker space and they get to kind of understand it better. So um, it's been great for me. One of the frustrating things though with co-hosts a lot of times is getting them to commit to a schedule. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of times, because, you know, if I'm the host, it's my baby a lot of times for the podcast. And, you know, and that's the excuse they've given me. Oh, well, I can't commit to this. This is your thing. This yeah. is, you know, if, you know, this is your show, you do what, what you're on your schedule. And it's like, no, I try to work with you guys. But trying to get co-hosts and people who are as enthusiastic as you are about your projects. Yeah. I think that's one of the things you have to consider when talking to somebody who might be a co-host. It's not just, oh, you're my best friend. I want to talk to you about this. Let's do this thing. Mm-hmm. You, I, I feel like that discussion is necessary of how much effort do we want to put into this collectively? How much are we each willing to do? What do we want to get out of it? What would make us want to stop doing it? Those are all conversations to have before you start. Yeah, you, you're evolving the relationship from, from just guesting on a podcast it's it, it's not even just a permanent guest spot. It is, I mean, co-hosts should take a partial ownership of what they're involved in. Mm-hmm. It, it is a whole new step up. And so when they come and they say, "Well, it's your baby," like, no, it's ours. You agreed to be my co-host. That means it's our collective thing. Mm-hmm. It's kind of sounded like a relationship, everybody. It is, yeah, it is. exactly. It is. And they can't just be there. Oh, you're just going to show up and talk and then go away. Right. You know. Right. That's week. that's not a co-host. That's a guest. That's a permanent yeah. guest. That's well, why and- I guest on favorite shows. <laughs> <laughs> and podcasts frequently, there's some money involved if you're hosting and streaming and finding out who's paying for that and all of that is, I think, super important and have that written down. So, who at the end of the day, if you break up, is going to own it? Yeah, so make sure you've talked about that. And you just covered it. Gotta no, 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 no. You, <laughs> you got it here, sir. Yeah. You're important. Right yeah. Tell them who you are. I'm Todd from Blueberry. Yes. Um, and they're awesome. We love Blueberry. They help sponsor us. We get the end result of breakups of podcast, mm. of the battles of who owns the show. Mm. So always have something on paper that says, yeah. I own the domain, I own the show, how that breakup's going to happen because often it actually goes to court. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. I've I've seen that before. Have yeah. it have it written down, even if it's yeah. not written by a lawyer. Have it have something in writing. Yeah. If you incorporate your show, if you create an LLC, which a lot of shows do, put it in your bylaws. How does somebody leave? How does somebody get added? How does somebody? How does the show end? What does the end of the show look like? Make sure that there are are termination clauses. If you're in a network, get a contract. Mm-hmm. Make sure that there's termination clauses that allow any party to initiate them you know there's there's lots of ways to to protect yourself and protect your show and when you do when you when you're in that beginning stage and i'm podcasting with a whole bunch of my friends or my best friend you don't want to ever think that that's going to be necessary but mm. it it might become that way and that's never a great situation but you have to to plan for the worst and hope for the best so what i'm hearing is get a podcast prenup Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. that's a perfect way to put it, actually. He's back. And I almost forgot, if you have an assistant, make sure they don't have all the keys to the car, because we've had assistants steal shows, too. Yep. Mm-hmm. Always know who, where your passwords are. Well, and, who owns and that's another thing. And, you know, I know we're running out short. You've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, make, <laughs> sure, make sure you own the rights to your show. And, like, when you join a network or if you join any other kind of organization, that they don't get the rights to your show. Because I've been in that place in the past. When we first started, we were in a, a network wanted to jo- us to join, but we had to sign it o- over to them. Mm-hmm. We would have to sign ESO over to them. And it was like, uh-uh, nope. No, 
always know who has the keys and keep them if you can. Yep. So I'm going to let Leanne here take us out. You want to tell people where to find you, where you're going next, and if they want to see you again, absolutely. which I know they want to, where they can do that. <laughs> uh, absolutely, because I uh, grew up in comedy clubs, and you can't spell my name unless you uh, gave birth to me and love me. Uh, <laughs> it's not that hard. It, oh, you'd be surprised after a two drink minimum that oh. GNH is just impossible. Never mind. Yeah. So I tell people they can find me and my work at veryfunnylady.com. I um, I summer on Instagram. I winter on Twitter. Uh, so I'm in those places as well. And we have um, I'm doing another panel tomorrow night at 1130. But I'm also on Solve for X. Uh, the, the science storytelling show. Uh, that's tonight. Oh my gosh, that's tonight at 10 o'clock. So um, get your libations ready and come and hear some funny stories from some sciencey people. Um, but beyond here, um, veryfunnylady.com is how you find me and be on the lookout for my new podcast, which is Auntie Energy. Whatever. Yeah. Awesome. What's your time? You can find me at or Station One, of course, or ESONetwork.com. And also, I'll be here, of course, throughout the weekend. I am in the middle of doing 19 panels this weekend. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm halfway through, folks. I'm almost there. Um, almost I'm going to be doing two, three more panels here on the podcast track today. I'm doing Shake Your Tail Feathers at 2.30. So you have a face for radio at 4. And then the 10th anniversary of the ESO Network at 8 30. So, in the cool room. In the cool room. So you can find us at curlinghermafia.com. And actually the Curling Her Mafia is going to be doing a panel tonight right here in the Hilton. Um, for Sven, um, where are we in the track room, the science track room, 209 to 11. Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Grant Review Board. What awesome. Time? I love what time that. What time is that? At 7 p.m. Okay. Awesome. You can catch me here today at 4. I'm on the Star Trek Strange Big Science and Strange New Worlds panel. And then tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Scientists vs. Nice. nice. <laughs> uh, once again, you can find me at creativecriticality.net. Because that's hard to spell, I have business cards. Uh, so you can take those with you, please. I don't want to take them home with me. Uh, I will be back here on the podcasting track for two events, uh, both today. I'll be moderating the Shake Your Tail Feathers discussion at 2.30. It's all about self-promotion. you got a podcast. What do you do next? And at 4 p.m., I'll be hanging around for the evolution of podcasting from audio to video. Mm. You can find me online at uh, womenatwarp.com or any social media. The show is at Women at Warp. Uh, I also have business cards and badge ribbons. I don't want to take those home either. So please come get them when we're all done. Um, here at the con immediately I am heading next door to the Brit track to talk about Shakespearean comedy adaptations to film and what are the best ones. Uh, later today, I'm talking about Russian Doll and the not-so-subtle queer sci-fi of the 1970s tonight. Nice. Uh, and tomorrow I'm spending almost all day uh, next across the hall in the Trek track. We're doing Wheel of Trek. We're going to put a bunch of topics on a Wheel of Fortune wheel and spin it around and talk about whatever it lands on. And um, later that day, we are talking, uh, we're going to be making fun of some bad Star Trek episodes during the Salamander Awards. And immediately after that, uh, Nichelle Nichols Memorial tomorrow night. Mm, lovely. And I'm Tara Burton, and you can fire me. Fine. Fire you? Uh, yes. And this is the first of five panels today. So the fifth one, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, I'm Tara Burton. You can find me at tyraburton.com and at the geeky side.com and geek meet social which are my two podcasts and hint hint want to interview all of you on the geeky side um you can find me at yoda verse and grubo robo i am gonna fail so bad now i do and i have not had any mm. is there bourbon in that mug me for the for the maker <laughs> for the uh but i'm at yoda and grubo i'm spending time with these two gentlemen today uh after that and then at 5 30 in the grand whatever I'll be talking about awesome women in the media, and I can't wait. Uh, we're going to have a blast there. Thank you all. Thank, thank you all you. on the stream. I know we got some people there. We appreciate you. Please yes. don't forget to thank Blueberry. Rate the panel on the app only if you liked it. And follow us on Twitch. And don't forget, donate to Open Hand. I'll have the digital code for that up on our social media right after this. Woohoo! I like the I grand whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's really that was awesome.